chapter 2, verses 1 to 21, is the sermon given on the day of Pentecost by Peter to all the people in Jerusalem that were gathered there for Passover, right? These, these are Jews. These are, can we say, pretend, not, they're, not, they're not unbelievers. Uh, they are people caught between two covenants. They are those who are faithfully attending the prototype sacraments of the Old Testament, right? The Passover meal itself is uh, pre-Jesus promissory attached to sign grace. I, we don't call it a sacrament because it's not really a sacrament, but a sacrament is an idea, is an Augustinian philosophical category, which is helpful, but, but it's not a biblical idea. So in, in the way the Bible talks, these are physical objects that have promises of grace attached to them. They're just pre-Jesus as opposed to after Jesus, and the ones after Jesus replace the pre-Jesus ones, right? They're superseded by, as it were, the pre-Jesus ones. So these are people that are there for that. They're, they're at least... And some of them are probably cultural, like, you know, cultural Christians, uh, cultural Lutherans, just kind of going through the motions. But some of them are there because they really believe in the grace and they're looking for the grace that's going to be given in these promises of the Messiah is going to come. They're waiting for the throne of David to be fulfilled and all that kind of stuff. And, and so that's why they're there at Pentecost. And so Peter preaches to them. This is why treating Pentecost like the model for Christian conversion, though, is a bit iffy. It's like, this is like... If I were to go to, you know, a big Pentecostal revival and preach the gospel to them and like half of them became Christians, <laughs> um, not that Pentecostals aren't Christians, but you know, they're kind of sometimes halfway there. Um, if suddenly they all converted to Lutheranism, it'd be more like that uh, than some sort of just, ma they, these aren't Muslims, right? These aren't rank atheists that are being converted. Anyhow, Peter preaches the sermon to them and it's quite long, but it's very good. It, and it's the... Is the paradigm, it is the, the structure and the format of all the sermons that are going to be preached throughout the rest of the book of Acts. And you can trace a lot of weird things happen in the book of Acts. There's miracles, there's tongues, there's just all sorts of crazy stuff. Paul gets bitten by a poisonous snake and doesn't die. You know, it, all sorts of weird stuff. But whenever they open their mouths, they say the exact same thing. So as much as things are changing around them in this turnover of the epoch from the old to the new, the end of the age of prophecy, the end of the age of miracles, I think, I believe, Scripture says, actually, make that case another time, but the, the end of the age of the charismata, yeah, um, at this turnover, there's something that stays consistent and continues going, and that is what Peter preaches on this day, what prophecy really is is all about. And as a, an aside now to this idea that the, the, the turnover from the charismata, from the, the, the holy gifts, the supernatural gifts. Someone says, well, the, the apostles had those. Yes, they did. The apostles did have those. And they had the ability to give them to others. But it, it seems, now we're just dealing with experience and history, it seems that those who they had the ability to give it to, right? I give you the gift of healing because I'm St. Paul and you're Cornelius or whatever, Peter and Cornelius. I give you the gift of healing, but you don't have the ability to give that gift forward, right? And the place where I connect this most clearly as a, as a shift in the New Testament is not the places where Paul says very clearly prophecy will cease. And I think that was actually really tough to argue once you break down the, the context of it. He says that, but in Matthew, do you know that there's two great commissions? We always talk about the great commission, the great commission, right? It's this big, it's this big um, mission thing from the, as if, as if the church growth movement's about the real mission of the church these days. It really has gone off the rudders, off the rudders, off the rails. Lost its rudder, gone off the rails, gone off the rudders. Same thing, same difference. <laughs> they, they really are, are more concerned about growth than they are about the mission of the church. But, but they, nonetheless, they, they gave us this, this title, Great Commission. You know, it's sort of, sort of the mission age of the last century, this idea we're going to convert the world with Pelagianism anyway. Um, but there's two. There's two places in Matthew's gospel, same gospel, where Jesus calls the twelve. And it just says, the twelve. Um, I think it says the... 11 and 28, Matthew 28. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Anyway, he calls the disciples and he commissions them two different places. One's in chapter 10 and one's in chapter 28. And in chapter 10, he says this. He says, go only to the lost sheep of Israel. That's the Jews. Go only to the Jews. Cast out demons, heal diseases. Uh, there's one other thing that's super powered and then preach the good news to them. So, Notice the gifts, the charismatic gifts given to the apostles to do among the Jews, right? And then in Matthew 28, he says, not go to the Jews. He says, go to all nations. A real clear contradistinction, a shift from what he'd said before. Go only to the Jews, 
go to everybody, right? Big difference. And now he doesn't say heal diseases, um, uh, speak in tongues. It, it, there's, there's nothing miraculous given except for baptize and teach. Hey, look what's still here, obviously. Hmm, notice that? I mean, it's like the baptisms, they happen. Teaching the word of God is still here. And then you look at Acts chapter, <laughs> Acts chapter 2, what happens? They're going to speak in tongues. We'll, we'll talk about that. But what happens? What does, he, what does he actually do? Does he heal diseases? I mean, that comes later. It's all around him. What's he there to do? Baptize and teach. Right. That's, that's the heart of the matter. All right, so Acts chapter 2. Skipping over Acts chapter 1. Jesus has risen from the dead, right? Uh, the, uh, he, the, you, he's got some of this in the last few weeks as well. The, uh, the apostles have replaced Judas. They have, um, is that all they do? They've watched the ascension. They replaced Judas. That, that's about it. Uh, I don't have one in front of me to just scroll back to. Um, yes. Matthias replaced Judas. Da, da, da. And so, and, and again, we've gotten ahead of ourselves in the text as well because we have like Peter preaching, not at Pentecost, but but another sermon, like Acts chapter 5 and 6, right? A while back. But it's because of the way the church is going, we want to have Pentecost on Pentecost Day, so here we are. When the day of Pentecost arrived, this is a little over 40 days, 50 days after, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the exact day, it's, it's 50 days after Passover? Is that right? Um, can't remember off the top of my head. But give or take 50 days, 50 days after Easter. But it's 49 days after Easter, so it's got to be Saturday. But that'd be, I don't know. It's 50 days later. <laughs> uh, Jesus ascends on day 40, which is this Thursday, by the way, ascension coming your way. Um, and they, this is the disciples, uh, Paul, or Paul, P, uh, Luke has told us, but this is then uh, with the disciples, you got to believe that there are, um, there are believers there that are not the apostles, but then there are the apostles there. And the emphasis here really is kind of on the apostles. They're the ones that are going to be giving these gifts. Sometimes you see in Roman Catholic stuff that Mary's got the tongue of fire over her head too. Uh, I mean, it's possible, but I don't think we can assume that in the text, and the text doesn't say more than that. And given the fact that what's going to happen here is the, the commission, right, the preaching, the public preaching, mm, you know, what the what the Bible says in the places about the office of the ministry, I think it's pretty clear that, that what's happening here is, is a uh, a preacher kind of thing. So anyway, they're in one place, though, and there's probably more people than just the apostles in this one place gathered. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And, and the, the language there of that filling, by the way, um, it's, it's, it doesn't say that the walls shook. It doesn't say that. But it kind of implies it's so full that things are, things are not stable, right? Uh, that there is a shaking. So it doesn't say earthquake, but I think that the, the language bears out that there is a wind and there is a quake. And this is important uh, in more than one way. I mean, wind, we already, uh, maybe you don't know, you should know, that, that in Hebrew, in Hebrew, golly, am I out of it, uh, that, that in Greek, wind is the same word as spirit, is the same word as breath, pneuma. And Hebrew works the same way. Ruach is the same. It's, it's breath, wind, spirit. And it's all three of those words bunched into one. And we translate it based on how the editors figured it should be translated. And so here they say that, um, a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing spirit, breath, wind. I think wind is fair here, but but notice the Holy Spirit's coming, right? The question is, is this wind the spirit? And that's that's where I want to draw your attention, right? Because you got the wind, you got the filling of the house, the walls are, are full and moving, right? Um, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. The place I'd call your attention there is, is twofold. First, it doesn't say divided tongues of fire. Look really carefully at it, right? It says as of fire, and it's that specific in the Greek too. Like unto fire. Not actually fire. <laughs> Their heads aren't burning. Uh, <laughs> and this is important on, on, on several levels. Uh, one being fire almost, not almost, like universally is a, a, a image of wrath. In both Old and New Testament, it's it's never good to burn, ever. Um, you do have the, I guess, you do have the the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. Our hearts burned within us. They're speaking figuratively. Anytime you're talking about real fire, uh, <laughs> uh, being ablaze, uh, it's this bad language, Old Testament style. Like that's like that's like you're gonna get the the comeuppance that you don't want to get because you deserve it. 
kind of thing. So it's tongues as a fire, which means Luke, you know, scientist that he is, he's trying to describe what was seen, which is that there's this like somehow glowing, crazy light on their heads. And there's a parallel of this in the Old Testament. Remember when Moses is up on the mountain and he actually sees uh, the way of God, but not his glory, because the way of God is to shield him from his glory so the wrath doesn't destroy him. Eh? Um, and he comes down, he's got the Ten Commandments, and what's happening? He used to say, if you look at these old woodcuts of him, he's got like he's got horns coming out of his head um, because it was translated wrong for a long time. They thought it said he had horns on his head, <laughs> and it was it's actually the Hebrew word for um, uh, a glowing sphere of sorts, a halo, if you can call it that. Um, his his head was on fire, or was as of unto being on fire. He was glowing in the face, and. I guess Luke could have, like, more intentionally used the same language if he wanted to convey that. But I'm kind of like, you know, this is the same language. Like, like we don't really, they, they didn't know what was going on with Moses' head. They're like, put it away, dude, cover it up, right? And uh, interesting that the people at Pentecost don't say put it away, cover it up. Although, I'm not sure they even see it. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, but uh, what you do have, again, is is God showing up in a very immediate way to somebody, Moses, the apostles, and the result is that they reflect the glory of God. They reflect his they reflect his 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 shine. Excuse me, I gotta burp. Kind of the way that Jesus clothing on the Mount of Transfiguration doesn't make shadows but reflects forward the light, right? And you kinda of have that happening with their faces. So I'm gonna say that's sort of what's going on here, but he does use the word fire. As a fire, right? Like fire, but like fire. And now, so here's this other thing. So you got the wind, you got the earthquake, and you got the fire, right? Which, if you know your Old Testament, you should know there's another story where there's a guy in a mountain who meets God, and there's a wind, and there's an earthquake, and there's a fire. Remember this? Remember this? If you watch Wii TV, you know this, because I, I tell this every time I come through this, because it's so, it's so worth remembering, right? Which is that Elijah, after he kills the prophets of Baal, has them all murdered and then flees because he's exhausted and stays in the desert. He's fed by the ravens, all this stuff. He ends up on the mountain of God, Mount Hora, Mount Sinai, effectively. And he basically says, God, I want to die. You know, I'm done. I'm done. I got sleep apnea. I can't stay awake. <laughs> you know, I'm done. Um, and, uh, and God comes and visits him on the mountain, the same mountain that he visited Moses on. Yeah? But when it says that it happens, first it says there's a big rushing wind. But this is something really important that you kind of want to have in your back pocket when you get to this text in Acts chapter 2. When it says that a great wind came from heaven, what does it say about the wind that came from heaven in Elijah's time? It says God was not in the wind. And then it says there was an earthquake. And it says God was not in the earthquake. And then it says there was a fire. And it says God was not in the fire. And then it says there was a still small voice to which every evangelical charismatic insane wannabe prophetic pastor ever says look deep inside your heart and listen for god there and they're nuts because that's not what it's talking about <laughs> you want a still small voice it's going to be a still small voice not a still small spleen <laughs> um the, the still small voice that spoke to elijah was audible it was outside of his head he could hear it if you hear voices talking to you audibly you probably need help. I, I mean that because, I, again, I'm, I'm a cessationist. I believe that the, the charismatic gifts have passed and what's left is the still small voice we're going to see in this text, which is not one that speaks to you and me audibly. Well, except for that I'm preaching it right now. But one that Peter preached here. Where's the small voice in this passage? It's when Peter will, in a few moments, stand up with the eleven, lift up his voice. And address the crowd. Where is the Spirit? Where is God in the preaching of Christ? Right? On the day of Pentecost. So the the radical reformation, which has left us the charismatic world, the Protestant world that is is ransacking American Christianity and gonna drive half of them to be Roman Catholic by the next end of the next twenty five years, which is just as bad, honestly. Um same stuff, frankly, just with with more bells and smoke. Um, and I, I like the smoke, you know. <laughs> um, they, everyone in, in the charismatic nonsense is chasing the spirit. 
They, they somehow think, they got this idea, like when they were big, they used to have a lot of people that went to their churches. We had, we had d- dominance over the culture at that point. And they, even then they're like, we got to get bigger. We got we to gotta do more. We need more spirit. And this chasing of the spirit thing, even from the Anabaptists on, it's never grown the church because it's never pointed to Jesus. And this is kind of the thing. So, so the more you go to try to find the Holy Spirit apart from Jesus, the more you find the spirits of the world. Because the only spirit that exists apart from Jesus is the spirits of the world. The spirits that we're supposed to discern, according to John, right? We're supposed to test them and not trust them unless they say that Jesus has come in the flesh, which, by the way, is a present participle still coming in the flesh right now, you know, this Sunday in the bread and wine, maybe. <laughs> yeah? Um, there. Getting ahead of myself there. But, where do you find the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? It's not on the fire. It's not on the earthquake. It's not on the tongues. The tongues don't work. <laughs> At least, I mean, they do. We'll get, we'll get to that. Um, but that's not why people believe. They don't believe because of the tongues. They believe because of the preaching of Jesus Christ crucified, which is where the, the text is going to go, because we're not going to get all that way quite today because we cut the thing in half uh, and all that. So, all right, so... They were all filled with the Holy Spirit directly, immediately. By the way, these guys, this is also why I can say I think these are apostles. Remember when he's in the upper room, he's like, I will send the other comforter to you. He's talking to them. He isn't quite talking to us at that point. He's not promising you and me to have this prophetic ability, this this total indwelling unto prophecy or unto inerrancy, right, in in our preaching. We have to rely on what was given to them, which is why Scripture alone is such a fundamental thing, right? Why would you ever say, I'm of the apostolic church, but not trust their writings? Makes no sense. Illogical, yeah? And I'm talking to you, Rome. That's right. Um, They're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, don't miss, it's going to talk about what these tongues are. It's going to be pretty clear. These are not the tongues of angels, at least in the sense of, these are not. this is not gobbledygook and gibberish. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is not made up languages this is not languages that cannot be tested these are languages that those who hear them know them and it strikes them immediately that that's what's going on so it, it, Luke tells us verse 5 and following uh, there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven hey go into all nations they came to you God brought them to you well, that's interesting right there and at the sound they all come together so they hear this great wind earthquake thingy that's going on they all come together and they're bewildered. Why? Because of the wind? No. They're bewildered because each one, that is every individual in this crowd of thousands, is hearing these 12 guys, which we should include Matthias in this, by the way. These 12 guys is speaking in his own language. Which makes me wonder. I mean, this is the, particularly this place. It makes me think about this gift of tongues. Along the lines, to me, it doesn't sound like Peter's speaking in Parthian. Sounds to me like Peter's still speaking Hebrew or Greek. But the Parthian dude, he's hearing it in Parthian. It's like the, the Star Trek uh, transmitters, right? The translators, right? It just does it in real time. You speak your language, they hear their language. They speak, <laughs> they speak their language and you hear and see them speaking in, in your language, right? Uh, it, it's kind of how I envision, envision this thing going on. There's no deleted going on, but... I don't know anything about Star Trek, I swear. <laughs> um, it's for nerds! Uh, <laughs> uh, so, they all hear, and the point is, the tongues are in what kind of language? They're in real human languages. Then he lists them for Pete's sake. Uh, they, they're saying out loud, aren't these guys, aren't these Galileans, aren't these fishermen, how do they know our languages? How is it that we hear them? Each of us in his own native language, not ridiculously made up noisy tongues, and then they list Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Cyrene, uh, visitors from Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretans, and Arabians. That's so awesome, Cretans. Um, you know, <laughs> they, they were well known for, for their obstinacy, actually, back in the day. Um, we Now, but don't miss what's being said in the tongue. Okay, so, so today's charismatic, charismatic crazy wants to think that these tongues are new revelations of who knows what, or even 
that they're mindless, right? That I'm speaking in the tongue, I don't even know what it means, but God and I are communicating and I'm getting some sort of spiritual juju from him and all this. What's the tongue saying in this text? We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Now, you can be dense and ignorant and say, well, we don't know what that means. Okay, well, that language in the Old Testament means one of two things. The exodus out of Egypt, whoa, let's go this way first. <laughs> the exodus out of Egypt, yeah, or the return from exile in Babylon. Always the mighty works of God is pointing back to those two things, one way or the other, right? Now, those two things, exile from Babylon, exodus out of Egypt, they point forward very clearly to one very real New Testament thing, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As the son was called out of Egypt in slavery, so the son of God was called out of the grave and the slavery of sin and death, which he took on his back for us. Similarly, the exile restoring mankind to our right relationship in the land, on the earth, in Eden with God. Right? Both of these just massive prophecies in action of what Jesus would actually do. And wait, there, there's more. I've got to catch my brain here a little bit. But, but there's another side to this as well. Which is that we know from the context that the very thing that they're talking about, the mighty work of God, is the resurrection of Jesus. And I can, I can prove it to you. Because they're not done talking. The people who are listening, they're like, how is it these guys are talking in our languages and telling us this amazing thing that God has done. And there's other people who are like, you know what? I hear what they're saying too. And they're drunk. They're drunk. Why? Because they're talking in, the, in their own language? Like, if I, if I heard you come up and tell me, like you're, you're some Galilean who, and I'm some Parthian. I don't know you from, from Adam. <laughs> uh, and you come up and you say to me, Good morning, sir. How are you doing? In my own native language, I'm not going to say, dude, you're drunk. Like, there's no reason for me to say that. It makes no sense. But if you come up and suddenly start saying, hey, that guy Jesus who they killed last week, what, 50 days ago, we saw him risen from the dead. Now, maybe I got a reason to think you're crazy. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And we know from Peter's response that this is exactly what's going on. So they hear the apostles in their own language by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, speaking miraculously that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Some of them marvel at this. Others say, these men are drunk. They're filled with new wine, which some moronic people will still try to tell you is grape juice, which totally gets people drunk and makes them say stupid things. Or it could be cheap wine, basically, because the good wine, it's aged, it gets older, tastes better. Everyone knows this, if you know anything. <laughs> yeah, um, it makes me want a glass of wine. <laughs> um, blah, 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 blah. They're, they're drunk. Peter then, it's all set up, right? Peter then, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, and that's all you're going to get the week after to, uh, to, to set up the second half of the sermon. He says, men of Judea, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> can't pause the show. Men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Okay, well, he hasn't said resurrection yet, but that's where he's going. <laughs> These people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, which in all likelihood means 9 a.m., super early in the morning, right? And you know, these guys are good, good Jews, good Orthodox Jews. Of course, they're not drunk at 9 a.m. in the morning. So let me tell you, let me explain, Lucy, uh, let me explain to you uh, why these guys are not drunk and why what they're saying, even though it sounds like insanity that some dude rose from the dead, that it's true. Now, we're actually not going to get to that part of his sermon to make my point, but you got to know that that's where he goes by the end of this thing, right? He drives all the way to the point that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And well, maybe we'll come there and, and kind of hit that right at the end, although we'll be picking it up again next week with the second half of the text. That is the mighty work of God that's been proclaimed in the still small voice of the apostles preaching through the midst of mankind's tongues, which we haven't even talked about, undoing Babel, by the way, right? Babel. Who does Babel? Who creates the chaos of Babel? It's the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes down and just messes with everybody. Yeah? Now it's being undone. How? The death and resurrection of Jesus. Words. Words. Of Jesus, the new man from born again from the dead, 
as vocable, actually present. More powerful than our words. Our words aren't this powerful. His words are. Words to create faith and unbelieving hearts, the greatest miracle of all. Yeah? So, that, my friends, is what I have to tell you about. Now, to prove this point, that it's not illogical to the Hebrew, he's not talking to the Greek, right? Which brings us back to the whole, the, the miracles for the Hebrews and not for the Greeks. Jews demand science. Greeks seek wisdom. Hmm? The Greeks don't even need <laughs> uh, miracles. They just need it to make sense. For the Hebrew, for him to, for the Hebrew to have it make sense, it has to align with prophecy. It has to align with the Old Testament, which is true, right? It's good. It's important. And, and so that's what he's going to do. He's going to show how the prop, some of, not all of, he couldn't do it all in one short sermon, some of the prophets of old can easily be pointed to what they see taking place. And he puts points to Joel and the coming of the Holy Spirit in, in Joel, the promise of the Spirit. And, but then he doesn't stop there. It's not just about prophecy falling out of the sky. Because then he starts to talk about how David said that he would never die. And that on his throne would be his own flesh. And there's this great move. It's next week, right? Where he, he turns and he points at the tombs. And, well, he's dead. Right there. So he wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about his heir was Jesus. See, so it makes sense that God didn't let the Holy One see corruption three days before he, before he decays, brings him back. Makes sense, guys. You killed him. Repent. It, it actually, it works. <laughs> it's a good sermon. We're not there. We just get Joel tonight. So he says, the third hour of the day, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Now, before we get into the prophet Joel here, we want to step back just a little bit and say, what does he mean by this is what was uttered? you got to think a little bit about how a Hebrew quotes the Old Testament, too. Because he's going to quote this giant chunk of Old Testament. But all he really wants us to get is one line out of the middle of it. The rest of it is not necessarily about the moment of him speaking. Although it is about what he's actually speaking about. Namely, the death and resurrection of Jesus. But the thing that he's trying to prove, right, to say, look... This is what prop, uh, what you're seeing right now, us telling about the death and resurrection in your own native languages, is what Joel said when he prophesied this. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You can add the young men seeing visions. You can add the old men's dreaming dreams. It's just repeating the same language. That what you are seeing in the preaching office on that day fearlessly proclaiming the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection into the winds of the chaotic age, that is the fulfillment of Joel saying, I'm going to send a new prophecy. I'm going to send a new spirit of prophecy. Now, is that saying that we never get to have this spirit? No, every time you confess the creed, you do it. That's why the creed is so valuable. I mean, you could, you could do it without the creed. I believe Jesus rose from the dead. There you go. See, it's not that tough. But you can't do it without proclaiming Jesus risen from the dead. This is not about how everybody in the Christian church is going to get their own little version of prophecy to get to fight each other over who we think is telling a better future. <laughs> uh, God went down that path once with the, the Old Testament prophets and under the kings and Christ. It just it became, it was a disaster. It's a disaster. And so prophecy is going to cease in the sense of new prophecy. But we get, we get the final, the final revelation. What more do we need? We have, we have the full thing, right? And that's what the New Testament effectively says. Uh, we have the full thing. So Peter has proven now his point. What you're seeing now is the Spirit giving us the final, the final prophecy, which we're going to preach to you. He goes on to say how, like he says again, uh, you know, uh, even on my male servants, female servants, the point is everybody's going to get to believe at this point. This prophecy is for everybody. It's not hidden like Isaiah's prophecy. If you've been following Red Fist Gras, you know that Isaiah's prophecies can be a bit obscure. <laughs> yeah? uh, it's hidden unless you got the right keys. This one's not hidden. There's nothing hidden about that. Everybody can own this. Everybody can confess this. I have no problem talking about the word prophecy being something that happens all the time in the modern church, provided we mean by it, confess. <laughs> yeah, but we don't. We mean tell the future. And, and, and no. No, no, it's not what's going on. So he, he's proven that the final prophecy has arrived in their mouths. They've already heard it. And now he links the rest of that passage. He, he brings in the rest of that passage because it links directly to everything else he's going to say. It's actually the outline for the rest of the sermon. He's, he said, look, here's what's happened first. The Spirit's here. Second, I'm going to show wonders in heavens above, 
Signs on the earth below, blood, fire, vapor, smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. Before the Lord, day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. If they were living in Jerusalem, oh, I said earlier they were here for Passover. I'm totally wrong about that. They're here for Pentecost. Pentecost is its own feast. So they came back. They were just there 50 days ago. Now they're back. Oh, I can't believe I messed, I messed that up. Bad. Um, I can't believe. I'm imperfect. Just like me. <laughs> uh... Uh, it's about the darkness. It's about the darkness. Embrace the darkness. Oh, the darkness. Ah. Uh. <laughs> totally lost it. <laughs> deep breath. Deep breath. It's just live TV. That's all. <laughs> um. What I can tell you for sure is that the prophecy here now shifts in its its cosmic existence. So I'm going to pour out the Spirit on all flesh, and they're going to tell what happened. The sun turning to darkness, the moon turning to blood. Oh, there we go. That's what it was. These people who have come for Pentecost, if they were also here for Passover, it should be fresh in their memory that like 50-some-odd days ago, the sun turned to darkness in the middle of the day. Like... Totally, they know this. No one can deny it because they saw it. They were there. It happened, right? And so he's pointing that out. This, the, the, what, what Joel said has actually taken place. The sun's turned to darkness. You also have this apocalyptic genre thing going on here where this language is about the end of an era. And you see this, I'd have to go to a number of Old Testament texts and I have to go look them up again to, to show you where. Isaiah, I think, is one of them, though, where it talks about the overthrow of, an, of, a, of a nation and it talks about the fall of that nation being the sun turning to darkness. So the language doesn't necessarily mean a literal fulfillment, although Jesus has this way of taking figurative fulfillments, virgin will be with child, that kind of thing, and making them literal fulfillments in his own fulfillment of them, right? So that when uh, the child Mahashalahasbaz was born to Isaiah, uh, shortly after the prophecy of the, of the maiden bearing a son, that was just a maiden bearing a son, but when Mary bears a son, it's an actual virgin. It means pushing it to its extreme. He does that here with this text, which is about the end of an era. It's about the end of, originally, Jerusalem. It's about the end of Babylon. Uh, it's about the end of Jerusalem again, and the Old Covenant, and, the, and, and any hope to go back to the sacrificial system. It's even bigger than that. Why does the sun actually turn to darkness on that day? It's about the end of the universe, as we know it. It's about the end of sin, the breaking of the fall. So that we live now, in a second era, a, really a third, if we can call it that, a third age of man. Think about the first age of man as being Eden, right? Perfect. First age of man. Second age of man. Fall. Not perfect, right? Third age of man. Resurrection. The crazy thing is right now, though, two and three, they're like this in history. With the cross being here and resurrection beginning and then the other one's still going, and then over here, this is the last day, except for the after the last day, there's going to be like more resurrection still, right? And we're living in the middle. We're like, <laughs> we're right there somewhere. Uh, there we go. Uh, we're right there, living in both worlds. By faith, we live in the age of resurrection already. Faith alone, right? Our, our flesh is not there, but our, our minds and wills and hearts are regenerated into that age, whereas we still have minds and wills and hearts attached to the flesh in this present age. That transition is bigger than the sun turning to darkness. Way bigger. Like the whole universe is just flipped on its head, right? Bigger than the moon turning to blood. That's why this language is being used to describe it's, it's such a big shift our brains can't fathom it. We cannot understand it. That is the prophecy which is poured out for them to proclaim, which is going to do by saying it happened in Jesus on the cross. And, remember this is like the sermon outline, right? And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Which is going to be the end of the sermon after he proclaims Jesus the Christ and they say, brothers, what shall we do? We're cut to the quick. He says, repent and be baptized every one of you and receive the Holy Spirit. Right? You're going to be saved. This promise is for you and for your children. So he, he goes to Joel to prove that the Holy Spirit was told to bring a final prophecy. He would pour out the Spirit. There'd be a new set of prophecy at a certain age and he links another two, the, the rest of that prophecy to say, now, here's what I'm actually going to preach with that prophecy. It was there, hidden, 
sealed behind a book that we needed Jesus to open. Oh, more Red Fist Raw. That's coming this Friday. Is the, the seals in Revelation getting cracked um, and what that book is and all that. But now Peter's doing it for you here. Men of Israel, 22. Oh, we're out of the text. Isn't it crazy? That's where they cut it. Ugh. 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 Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders. Mighty works of God. Mighty works of God, the same language. Mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know this, Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up. Same sermon all the way through the book of Acts. God raised him up. Loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. That is something more phenomenal than the sun turning to darkness. That is creation itself turned upside down. So that like, like the grave now is flipped and we're all falling out of it. Because <laughs> Jesus changed gravity. More. It's more than gravity, right? It, it, it's just it's beyond, our, beyond our understanding. And then it's going to go on to talk about David's prophecy, which is great. And we'll hit that next week. Um, absolutely phenomenal uh, prophecy. I, this sermon, this sermon, I, you could preach this sermon alone forever and we'd be fine. It's all we need. I mean, you get the Lord's Supper is not here, but it, it should be the model for every sermon you ever hear. Honestly, I mean, it, it, every sermon you hear, God help me and pastors out there, if you, if you watch this, I'm not trying to accuse too directly, but we don't preach like this often enough. We get this kind of like, law gospel jargon thing going on, right? Where it just, oh, he just lays out the truth, right? He, he brings the history of the matter to bear and then lets, lets it do its work and it's good stuff. Yo, he turn our rhythms in your system so clear. No negative, take your ism, stay clear. We keep it lovely, give you what you want here. No, you won't hear